Thank you, Jacinta, for that report. Staying with development at the AFDB, President Muhammad Buhari has congratulated Akimwumi Adishina on his re-election as president of the African Development Bank. Adishina was unanimously returned as president earlier on Thursday during the bank's 55th annual meeting, which has been held virtually due to COVID-19 restrictions. In a statement signed by the presidential spokesman, Fermi Adishina, President Buhari said, the news of the victory came during the Council of State meeting, which was attended by former heads of state, Senate presidents, governors and some ministers, as well as uh, senior government officials. According to the president, his re-election is well deserved. The president extends appreciation to the African Union for its endorsement of the AFDB president much earlier and to shareholders of the bank who worked tirelessly to ensure the return of Adishina. Former Nigerian Minister of Finance Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala has congratulated Akimumi Adishina on his re election as president of the African Development Bank. Okonjo Iwiala, who is also seeking appointment as the Director General of the World Trade Organization, congratulated Adishina via her verified Twitter handle. To look at this historic development, we're joined by policy analyst Ifi Oji, as well as legal practitioner. Michelle Agati said, thank you very much for joining us. We'll go straight to you, um, Michelle, with this uh, one. A hundred percent vote for the first time in the bank's history. How significant is it that this man is re-elected, especially having just recently faced a pro panel, not once, but twice? Good morning, Felicity, and um, thank you so very much for having me. Um, I think I would like to answer this question from the end of the question, being that he recently faced the pro panel not once but twice. We have to understand the context of that pro panel, and it was the case that, um, you know, with the initial pro, he was cleared. He was cleared very convincingly, but it was as a result of one of the shareholders' insistence that there has to be an independent probe and the like, which was the United States of America, that led to the second probe, which was really a probe of the first probe. So it was a situation where two times in a row, he was um, clearly and convincingly cleared of all allegations. And as a result of that, um, he has demonstrated that he's in fact clean. That's on the one hand. Now on the second hand, about the 100% unanimity in the vote, we have to look at it and unbox it from two different angles. The first angle is the angle of performance and um, all would recognize across the continent that he has done an exceedingly good job in the AFDB. Um, sometime in May, I remember that Cyril Ramaphosa alongside Ellen Johnson Turley, former president of Liberia, took out some time to specifically commend the AFDB under the leadership of Akilmi Adeshino for what he's doing over there. And it shows the performance um, you know, um, endorsement that he has received leading up to this lecture. And the third and most important thing is the context within which he was elected. If you remember, when the pro panel um, was set up and they were doing their work, um, there was this feeling across the continent that it was the situation that um, the United States of America a shareholder, yes, but a non-African shareholder was seeking to dictate the tune for the dance steps. And as such, the African continent, including the African Union, I remember Olushegon Obasanjo writing a very forceful letter, you know, almost saw this as a slight. So across the African voting bloc, there was already that feeling that we need to get this guy re-elected. And um, I think for the United States of America, as well as other foreign shareholders, to the extent that their, um, um, shall I say, concern was um, assuaded by virtue of the second probe, um, then there was really no basis for them not to vote for Akiomi Adeshino or to abstain from voting, because then it will be as though you're witch hunting. So when you combine that, a power block, that's the United States and their voting bloc, who had issues and their issues were assuaded, giving them no basis not to vote for Akiomi additional one. And the other power block being the African voting bloc, who right from May already had it in their sights that, look, we're going to get this guy re-elected. Then it doesn't come as a surprise to me that um, he had 100% 
um, vote, especially when you look at it, in my alongside years, context that he was the, the announcement of my re-election as president. president. All right, uh, let me come to you, Ifi. Um, writing off what Michel has said, the activities around the probe for a lot of persons brought to the fore the um, activities of the AFDB. And a lot of persons have said with his reemergence, a lot is expected. It's a change. So I would want to know from you, mm -hmm. can you... For those that might not have been invested in the activities of the AFDB, can you talk to us about some of the strategic functions of the AFDB and how it affects uh, the people watching right now? Okay, for so most, most people that don't know about the AFDB, it's basically, uh, it came together in the, uh, in, uh, I think it was the 70s or the 70s, and it's basically started by Nigeria to basically try and create a fund where Africans would have some sort of uh, uh, stake, stakehold and holdership of what's going on in Africa and have some um, from funds from that as well. And Nigeria was obviously leading in the forefront of that. But more than anything else, the African Development Bank signified right now as we stand, one of the biggest, um, the biggest multilateral uh, institution in Africa. And I think it's important because even 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 from a, a cult a cult a cult, um, a cult point of view, there is no vlogger right now that doesn't understand what the board composition of the African Development Bank is, just based on the uh, unique nature of what has occurred in the last several weeks. So I think it's actually really crucial to make sure that, um, and also because because they have a lot of um, different uh, policies. I know they have the. Um, they have the um, excuse my my um, my phone is wrong. They have the um, sorry. Um, just give me a second. They have right, a, let, base, let, a basic we'll, we'll understanding of. We'll come back to you, we'll back to you in a bit. Let's let's go back to sorry, you. Go uh, let's go back to uh, Mitchell for a, a second. The bank has maintained its AAA ratings uh, by all major global credit rating agencies for five years in a row. Do you expect this to be sustained in his second term? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't see why um, the bank's rating should go down. Um, from a very corporate governance point of view, um, corporate governance wise, the bank has been very well run. Um, finance wise, the bank has been very well run. Um, investment wise, the bank has been very well run. And um, despite the fact that COVID-19 is um, bound to have an effect which might then, you know, begin to affect the finances, begin to affect the returns and receivables of the bank. I see that um, with the economic policies across the continent, one, as well as the early shutdown that you saw in most African countries, and I focus on African countries now because most of them have been borrowers, um, you then see that um, we're likely to have a V-shaped kind of economic, um, should I say, um, you know, future, in which case, you know, all the downturns maybe between 2021 and 2022 will begin to, you know, rise again. And when you look at it from the perspective that Airbnb loans are more or less long term, um, then you see that, well, it's well suited that um, we're unlikely to see any major defaults that would then affect their own, you know, um, should I say, loan obligations to other third parties. So, yes, I don't see there. If I may add to what um, Owa has also said as well, I just wanted to just add as well that um, don't forget that also they're able to do a lot of um, work with uh, the um, the general capital increase that moved authorized share capital from 93 billion to 208 billion, giving them an opportunity to reaffirm its capacity to meet its financial obligation, a far cry from its near collapse in 1995. We also want to also remember that it's also been issued a three billion fight COVID-19 social bond to cushion the effects of COVID in Africa in the largest ever dollar denominated social bond in recorded history. And it was oversubscribed by 50% of the original bond value. And um, these are sort of things that we should not gloss over in terms of our understanding of where they are in their financial capacity based right. on the different rating and um, um, rating uh, system from Fitch to Standard and Poor's and uh, yeah. also uh, Moody's as well. 
Oh, we'll certainly try and cover as much ground as to um, what um, Dr. Adeshino has been able to accomplish. There's been a lot of compliments. Both of you uh, seem to agree on that score. But I want to ask you, I think I'll put the question in, um, in different ways to both of you, but I'll start with you. I'll stay with you, uh, Ifi. What's your assessment of the implementation of his High Five initiative in this first term? You know, that was the pillar, uh, Light Up Africa, uh, Feed mm -hmm. Africa. Yes. Absolutely. Should it be sustained or do you think you should consider new initiatives with the reality of the COVID-19 as it were? Well, I mean, again, I just as I had just uh, made a, a note of right now, he's, the, 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 the issuance of the bond, the special $100 billion they've provided as well to fight COVID specifically has been taken care of. They should, but they, they, they cannot lose sight of why they are there in the first place. And it's the economy and driving economic growth within Africa. That is actually priority, regardless of whatever situation we find ourselves. There can be social protection measures that can be taken, but all that really matters, all that is really at the core of what his message is. And don't forget, he's been very, very focused in terms of driving that point, even with high five. And even with his speech yesterday, he talked about deepening the impact. Deepening the impact for me means that he understands from a very foundational point of view, how, how important it is to ensure that economic growth is at the forefront of uh, the development of Africa. I mean, you, I mean, I know we've spoken, I'm not sure if you spoke about this already, but obviously the completion of the Nairobi Addis Ababa corridor yes. to, to, um, to also to, to develop trade between Ethiopia and uh, Kenya and volume of trade in, in the, between those two countries has tripled. It has tripled. And that is just in line with, with making sure, that having them as the leaders and as the drivers of intra-Africa trade in, in, uh, in, within the continent. And another thing you should also, we should also um, not lose sight of as well is that, yes, there might be very sexy things to think about, but even in his initial, his first few speeches as he took over the helm from the, um, his predecessor, he made it very clear that Africa was going to have the most, uh, the, the, la the lion share of arable land in the continent, in the, in, um, the globe. And that was good. And, and he was going to make sure that he, he had at least, um, he at least made sure that 25% of investments uh, from the African Development Bank were, were channeled towards agriculture. And I, I don't think that is um, um, in, in any way going to have to change based on uh, COVID reality. In fact, I think agriculture has, has, has shown us that it is, it, um, I, think, I think the issues that we've had with COVID has shown us how important agriculture is. And also the importance of making sure that we have infrastructure to drive all our, our needs across Africa, especially in, in, turmoil, in turmoil times like this. All right, uh, Mitchell, in what areas, because we do have a situation that's affecting the world, not just Africa. Um, so I think this question is pertinent. In what area are you most concerned he might have challenges with the new reality of COVID-19 in the implementation of some of his initiatives? Hey, um, thank you. So I think um, maybe even before highlighting, you know, the high fives include Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa, Industrialize Africa, Integrate Africa, then improve the quality of life um, for the people of Africa. Now, when you look at all of those things, right, you know, with Light Up and Power Africa, Feed Africa and the like, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, investment and there's been a lot of progress. You know, I was reading in his speech that, look, 141 million people have benefited directly from the agricultural interventions, 15 million people from access to finance. But when we look at um, improved integra integration of Africa, that requires, you know, two things. One, we see what has happened with the African Union, you know, access to visas for African business people across the continent. But the question then is, post-COVID, are governments willing to take on significant financing loans to build the roads that will connect countries? Are they willing to take on financing and loans to build the rail tracks that will connect countries? I don't think so. So I think that that's on itself or in and of itself um, will be a significant challenge. Why? I think that governments across continents want to focus on bread and butter policies right now. They want to get their people sustaining themselves again. They want to get the economy booming and the like. So things like, you know, agriculture, for example, those things are quote unquote, for lack of a better word, sexy, right? Things like feed Africa, those things are sexy. People are going back to work. 
But things like, oh, let's build a new fancy airport. Let's get a rail track from, you know, Lagos all the way to Addis Ababa. Mm, I'm not sure that people will be too keen to take on financing for that. So I think he's going to struggle on integrating Africa. And that's a shame because um, we have to understand long term as well that um, economic integration across the continent um, is good for individual countries because that's really what's going to then spur proper economic progress um, for localized countries. But um, I think that in terms of integrating Africa is going to struggle. Um, and also because of the fact that um, this is not something that can be pushed only from AFDB. This is something that needs to be pushed on the local government level. And by local government, I mean like the federal governments of countries, as well as on an African Union level, you know, such that people are on the same page. Because it's one thing for Nigeria to want to integrate, but it's another thing for Bennett Republic to also be keen to integrate. So without that diplomatic, um, should I say, meeting of minds, consensus at Eden, um, then you're going to struggle significantly. So if I could just add to what we were saying as well, I don't know if that's necessarily uh, the case because I mean, we already have an agreement in place that takes care of that. We have the Afri African Consultory Future Agreement. That's already in place. So there's not really his issue to deal with in terms of making sure that these countries are compliant. His only issue is just to make sure that, they, it is, he, that he's able to facilitate as you rightly said, who are those kind of policies. And uh, from a, even from an operational point of view, I don't think anyone expects him to be labeled with the uh, sole responsibility of ensuring that those infrastructures are put in place. You know, that that's what uh, the different financial me mechanisms are there. That's why there are, there are numerous multilaterals are across Africa, even within the globe. And that's why even with the inclusive policy of having different member states, uh, regional or non or otherwise, within the African Development Bank, that, they are, that there is a conscious effort to ensure that it is as, inclus as, in as inclusive as possible. All right, uh, let's come back to you, uh, uh, Mitchell. Um, as somebody who has an interest in finances, the African Investment Forum mobilized investment interest for Africa in 2018 and 2019 with the outbreak of COVID-19. Do you think that the bank will be able to achieve optimal investment, most especially uh, with the aftermath of the COVID-19. You, you, I mean, you both expressed concern about uh, some of the initiative that he has already. Um, thank you. If I understand clearly, are you saying that um, whether post-COVID-19, the bank will be able to have enough financing to execute some of their projects and to unlend? I don't, I don't think I along, Something along those lines, Is that the yes. understanding? Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, I, I really don't think that that's going to be a problem. Um, as Ify alluded to earlier, uh, earlier in the year, especially on the onset of COVID-19, um, the bank set out um, the COVID-19 intervention fund. Uh, they went on the, on the Eurobond market um, and, you know, raised financing. Um, I can't remember exactly how much it was, but it was a sizable and 4 .5. 4 .5. Exactly, $1.5 billion. 4 .5. And that was oversubscribed. Yeah. Exactly. $1.5 billion. And that was oversubscribed. So, um, you know, that really cushions the effect um, such that they're not plugging holes for their interventions arising out of COVID from their retained, um, you know, financing, retained capital and the like. So when you look at it from that point of view, I really don't see any um, significant adverse effect. Now, however, however, um, we're still in the early stages of COVID. Um, a vaccine has not been gotten. Um, if you look at the news reports, there are still concerns about whether there might be second lockdowns or the like. So it's also dependent on what the next few months uh, bring in terms of COVID. If we um, turn the tables, you know, and begin to conquer COVID and economic activity begins to reemerge and normalize, then I don't see any real effect. But if we have a second real wave, similar to the first one, then it becomes a problem. Why? Um, you have investor wariness, so it might be difficult to raise that kind of financing, again, because um, people are weary. Um, secondly, as well, is the case that people are then um, uncertain about how long this is really going to take in terms of the reemergence from COVID. And remember, I spoke of V-shaped economic outlook. Um, then that becomes to be really threatened. You know, across the world, in other continents, um, the V-shaped is not really seen as, um, um, should I say, uh, 
realistic um, growth objective. However, on the African continent, because of a number of factors, including the speed of growth amongst countries before COVID, um, coupled with the fact that um, the response to COVID has been much better um, than in other continents as well, um, the V-shape still looks like an economic outlook that is possible. But when that becomes threatened, um, it then affects, you know, it's, 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 it's like a domino, really. You know, you hit one and everything falls apart. So it's still very shaky. And um, it's something that we can't really postulate with certainty on at the moment. But we can only be hopeful that um, if we begin to conquer COVID, then we won't really see an impact because they have taken all the right steps to cushion that impact. Um, um, on themselves. I don't know if you, if, you, if you would like to chip in on this as well. All right. Um, uh, yes, I could okay. just chime in for a second. I Well, I don't know about the V-shape v or the U-shape, or the a, but I know based on what uh, academics have been saying, that it's a more, that it's more based on, and based on the contraction trend as well, that it's more likely to be L for the uh, foreseeable. And just till we're able to get up, so maybe possibly a U-shape at the end. But, but what I will, will say is this, that Beyond what is very certain right now is the uncertainty of it all. Everyone knows that they have to find a way to sort of adjust and find ways around it and um, uh, the issues that COVID brings. Right now, I don't know if um, they, they, they may feel that they are getting enough um, uh, relief, um, that most of the African countries are getting enough relief at the moment. So it's always, always going to be a, a, a joint effort to ensure that uh, the needs of, uh, of most people are met during COVID and then just to make sure that at least that's taken care of before they're able to move on to tackle tackle to tackle bigger issues as they as they come forward. All right, stay with you still, Ify. The African continent is known for being uh, mostly a patriarchal uh, community. Um, what do you think uh, Dr. Deshina has done as a woman looking at these things to finance women and their businesses in Africa? Because like it or not, they're integral Okay, well, I know, I know, for example, last year, I wasn't able to attend, but I was close to attend the Global Gender uh, Summit Initiative, which is one of his big ticket items um, for, the, um, um, for his calendar. Um, that is basically taking into account the fact that more than 50% of uh, Africa's population are women, and uh, just bringing, bringing to the fore the issues that it will take for um, African business women to be able to get their foot in the door and just have some form of parity in terms of... Um, creating a, a more uh, enabling environment in, in, as a, um, in the workforce of Africa has. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the statistics are right now at the moment, but it, it, I, will go, I, will, I will put my neck out and say that, we make, that women make up more than 50% uh, of the labor force in Africa. And, um, and, and Africa in general is, has a huge labor force compared to other continents. So I, I, um, he's, he's, the Global Gender Summit is one of them. I know he has also another initiative um, that he had put forward last year as well. And even as part of the um, Africa Investment Forum, he is very gender forward. And um, we just hope that he's able to continue, as he says, deepen the uh, impact, as he says, for um, his next uh, tenure in office. All right, Mitchell. Um, I mean, the whole controversy around the probe and the support, the rallying in Africa to um, make sure additional came back has been achieved. So. What more do you think can be done to enhance the global image of the AFDB so it can, you know, better impact Africans under his leadership? Okay, thank you. Um, I think that um, Akemi Adishina is taking all the right steps um, at the moment. And to be honest, I would say that um, he should just go full speed ahead with what he's doing. Um, in terms of the high fives, if he can ensure that he deepens that such that it's not just a flash in the pan, but um, at the end of the next five years, we can say that, look, there's been real significant and tangible impact alongside that. That would be awesome. Um, you would find that, um, you know, just earlier this year, the bank was ranked the fourth most transparent institution globally, right? And that's, that's big for an African institution. And um, if they can continue the way they're going, these are these corporate governance and the like. Who says we cannot be first, you know, um, most transparent institution in the world? And what that does is that it begins to increase investor confidence. So as I said, I think he should continue um, along the same lines that he is. 
let's not say that, look, he was a one-term guy and the first term was great, things fell apart in the second term. Um, if he continues on the trajectory, I really see um, a bright future for the AFP. All right, uh, if he, your, your final thoughts on this matter. The rallying we saw was unprecedented around um, uh, such a key position. And now that he has secured that seat again, um, what, are your, what are your words to him? And how can African leaders, uh, besides the support, the solidarity that they show going forward, help him to, you know, better Im um, impact um, the African continent? I don't think that they're, they're as as um, Ola has said. I don't think they've done anything that has um, they've taken a wrong step at the moment. But what I will say to them is to always make sure that they're able to consolidate and integrate, consolidate their ideas, consolidate their um, commonalities, consolidate anything that brings them any, um, any kind of um, that makes any kind of similarities and they find commonalities. That's where that they should focus their energies at. I find a lot of times that in a lot of these high level, high level events, that there's a lot more discussion around what the issues are, what the problems are, and I and and they, they spend a lot of time talking about what the issues are and not really looking at how they can, in practical terms, work on their commonalities and use that as a building block for actionable um, for actionable decisions. All right. Thank you very much. I actually, I'm not into a lot of uh, money talk, but I really enjoyed the conversation uh, with both of you this morning. Thank you uh, for your time. Uh, Mitchell Agatise and Ifi Oji. Thank you, Felicity. Thank you Do enjoy the rest of your day.